Hey, this is X Cult Baby, and at last, I am doing another atheist Bible reading. The Bible story we'll be dissecting today is the story of a man named Jephthah. This is not a commonly talked about story, it's not super well known, but if you're someone who claims the Bible as your moral authority, you should definitely know about this story. As well as talking about the actual story, I'm also going to talk a little bit about some of the apologetics that certain Christian groups have tried to use to justify the atrocities in the story. Well, with all that said, let's get into the story. So, as usual, the Israelites have cheated on their one true jealous god by going off and worshipping other gods. He is not very happy about this, so he allows the surrounding nations to conquer and oppress the Israelites. And after about 18 years of this, the Israelites go running back to him for his forgiveness. And at first, of course, God is petty. He's all like, why don't you run over to your other little gods to help you? I'm sure they'll help you. Mm. But then the Israelites actually go and get rid of all their false gods. So their God is like, all right, I guess I just can't let you keep suffering. Enter Jephthah. He's described as a mighty warrior and the bastard son of his father Gilead and some random prostitute. Gilead's wife also has sons, and when they grow up, they drive Jephthah out of his father's land because they don't want the family bastard to get their father's inheritance. Sometime later, when Israel is supposedly being blessed again, they are going to fight against the Ammonites, and the elders of Gilead go running to find Jephthah to get him to come and lead them into battle. And understandably, Jephthah is like, why should I help you guys when you hate me so much that you drove me out of my father's land? And they're all like, oh, Jephthah, you're such a mighty warrior. If you help us, then we'll let you be the leader of all the people of Gilead. Apparently, Gilead is not only his father's name, but also a region or a group of people. I'm not 100% clear on that, but apparently he's going to become their leader if he wins this battle for them. So Jephthah starts off by sending a message to the king of the Ammonites, and he's like, hey, why are you even attacking us? And the king of the Ammonites is like, uh, we're just trying to take back the land that you stole from us when you guys came out of Egypt. So, you know, it's kind of ours. And we're totally cool with ending this peacefully if you just give it back. And Jephthah's like, well, we wouldn't have gotten that land if God hadn't given it to us. So, yeah, it's ours now. So, they're still at war. And this is when things get really fucked up. Jephthah makes a vow to his god that if he gives Jephthah victory over the Ammonites, when he gets back from the war, whoever, or whatever, depending on what Bible translation you're using, comes out of his house to meet him first, will be offered to God as a burnt sacrifice. And to be clear, almost every Bible translation that I checked used the term burnt offering or burnt sacrifice, so there's really no room for interpretation on the language here. It's not ambiguous at all. There's also nothing else anywhere in this passage that implies that he is using burnt offering as a metaphor or something for something else. It's pretty clear and literal on this point. Now, there are verses in the Bible that imply that the God of the Bible isn't a huge fan of human sacrifice. So if the Bible is, let's say, the inerrant word of God, we would expect to see no contradictions on this point. So if that is true, the next thing that should happen after Jephthah makes this vow to God is that God should probably like strike him dead for even suggesting that he would find a human sacrifice acceptable. Or he could let Jephthah meet his death in battle against the Ammonites and then the Israelites would lose to show that God was not blessing that at all. Either way, if we're to avoid contradiction here, the Israelites should be losing this battle against the Ammonites and Jephthah should be dead, right? Okay. So anyways, back to the story. After successfully defeating the Ammonites in battle, Jephthah returns home unscathed. The first person that comes out of his house to meet him, unfortunately, is none other than his daughter, who is also his only child. So as soon as Jephthah sees his daughter, he's like, ah, oh, fuck. Why did it have to be you? I can't go back on my vow to God now because he's already blessed me. I have to hold up my end of the bargain. And Jephthah's daughter's like, you know what, Dad? It's fine. I know you have to keep your promise to God. Just let me go off into the mountains for two months to weep with my friends about the fact that I'm going to die a virgin. Then, you know, it'll be fine. So Jephthah's daughter cries about dying a virgin for two months. Jephthah fulfills his vow. And every year from then on, the young women of Israel go away for four days and commemorate the sacrifice of Jephthah's daughter. The end. 
So the Bible translation that Jehovah's Witnesses use, the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures, adds a brief phrase in verse 35 of Judges chapter 11 where this account comes from. In addition to Jephthah saying that he's, you know, in sorrow because of his daughter, it adds that he's said that she is the one he has to banish, using the word banish. This addition isn't present in any other Bible translation that I could find. And it clearly implies that he, instead of killing his daughter, he's just banishing her in some way. Definitely implies that there's not an actual human sacrifice going on. Additionally, in verse 40 of the same chapter, it says that the young women of Israel, at least in the Jehovah's Witness translation of the Bible, it says that the young women of Israel would go and give commendation to the daughter of Jephthah every year. Again, implying that she's still alive somewhere. Again, no other translation of the Bible that I found had this implication. Instead of saying they were going to her to give her commendation, all the other translations I found said that they, they lamented her, they wept for her, they commemorated her, they mourned her, they grieved her, they celebrated her, but none of those imply that she is still alive. Those translations certainly make it sound like she's fucking dead. The reason that these changes are present in the New World Translation is that Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jephthah didn't actually sacrifice his daughter as a burnt offering, and instead sent her away to Shiloh to serve in the tabernacle for the rest of her life, thus being celibate and eventually dying a virgin. As I said before, there's absolutely nothing in this passage or anywhere else in the Bible that talks about Jephthah that indicates that his daughter just went to serve in the tabernacle and wasn't actually literally a human sacrifice. This whole narrative is completely fabricated by Jehovah's Witnesses because they refuse to believe that there is a recorded biblical account of God accepting and blessing a human sacrifice. If they think that's bad, wait until they hear about this guy named Jesus. And it's not like I don't understand why they pretty much refuse to believe this. I mean, a human sacrifice is clearly an atrocity. They can't accept that their perfect and holy and loving God would ever allow such a thing to be done, let alone accept and bless that action. They could reason that, huh, maybe my interpretation that the God of the Bible is like this perfect, benevolent, loving being is incorrect, and maybe the God of the Bible is just, you know, more like other gods from other mythologies that are imperfect and more human-like. Or maybe they could reason, well, wow, this is a huge, real, glaring biblical contradiction, and maybe the Bible isn't God's inerrant word. Maybe I shouldn't believe this word for word anymore. But instead, they alter the text and try to make up apologetics to explain this away, even though the truth couldn't be more obvious. That's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like, leave a comment, and most importantly, share it with somebody who is convinced that the Bible is the one and only perfect source of morality. Follow me on Twitter at xcultbaby if you want to interact with me or contact me or make any suggestions for future videos. You can also contact me via my email at xcultbaby at gmail.com. If you'd like to support my work, please consider becoming a patron. The lowest patron tier on Patreon is only a dollar a month and every little bit helps. I'm Excult Baby, reminding you to go free yourself. Thank you for watching. Additional thanks to my amazing patrons. Thank you so much for continuing to support my work.